Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this Earth Day for a special presentation. We're really excited to have Becca here with us to talk about Rain Smart Neighborhoods. And before we get into everything, I'm just going to go over a bit of logistics with everyone. And that will also give people time to jump on the call if they're a few minutes late. So the two people that are going to be with you for the next hour are Becca Robinson from Reap Green Solutions. And you can see her email on the slide. If you have any questions after the fact, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the call today. But if you have other questions afterwards, or maybe you wanna learn more about what Reap Green Solutions can do for you on your property, you can send her a message. And my name is Monica. I'm the Communications and Fundraising Manager at Watersheds Canada. So if you're having any tech problems or if you have any questions about what Watersheds Canada specifically does, you are welcome to send me either a private message in the chat or an email. And if you're not familiar with Watersheds Canada, we are a national nonprofit and charitable organization that works with landowners, community groups, and students to help them protect their fresh water. So you can see some of our programs on the slide focus on specific habitat restoration. We also work collaboratively with partners and community groups to deliver education and stewardship programming that all looks at protecting the health of lakes, rivers, and shorelines. And one of our initiatives is the Freshwater Stewardship Community, which is why you are all here today. So this was launched at the beginning of last year and has since grown to over 1,300 members across seven countries. Everything that has ever happened through the community is archived on our website. So if this is your first time hearing about the community or your first webinar, you are welcome to go back and check out all 18 webinars. And 14 of those webinars have handouts that accompany them. And in a few minutes, I'll show you the one that is going to accompany today's presentation. And all of those resources can be found at watersheds.ca uh, slash freshwater hyphen stewardship. And we would like to thank the Peterborough KM Hunter Foundation and SM Blair Family Foundation for their support of the freshwater stewardship community. So before we get into today's talk, I just want to let everyone know about the next presentation that is going to be happening in the freshwater stewardship community. And that is happening on May 17th. And we'll be looking at using satellite technology to assess algal blooms, specifically with a case study in the prairies. However, it is transferable to any lake that is experiencing algal blooms. So you'll be able to register for that at the same place where you registered for today's. And I've also just put that information in the chat if you are interested in going to register as registration opened this morning. As I mentioned, almost all of our presentations have a education handout that accompanies them. So this is the one that was created for today and it will be up later today on our website. And you will also receive a link to it along with the recording from today, early next week. And this is a great resource that summarizes a lot of the key points that Becca is going to go over today and also has a number of resources hyperlinked out on the bottom. So all the underlines are actually free resources that will touch on topics from today. And this is a great resource for you to share on social media or with your community group or lake association to help prompt people to check out the full recording and also some of these great resources and specifically about Rain Smart Neighborhoods. So with all of that, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Becca Robinson who has helped hundreds of property owners in the Waterloo region make landscape changes that are more resilient to climate change, reduce community flood risk, and protect the Grand River watershed. Becca has a master's in landscape architecture and a bachelor of science in environmental science. So with that, I will pass it over to you, Becca. Thank you very much. Let me get my presentation shared here. Okay. 
Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining me on this lovely Friday morning here in Kitchener, Ontario. Hopefully it's lovely where you are as well. Um, my name is Becca Robinson, as Monica mentioned, um, and I'm looking forward to chatting with you guys for a bit about various actions you can take on private property that will help downstream uh, waterways and watershed health in general. Uh, it's like one of the first warm sunny days we've had here and so there's like a low din of chainsaws and leaf blowers and kids and dogs outside so hopefully that won't be distracting but it's kind of nice reminder that it's time to get outside and steward our properties. So I'm looking forward to sharing some tips and ideas for you to take forward, hopefully on your own property. So um, as Monica mentioned, I am from an organization called Reap Green Solutions. We're an environmental charity that's been helping people in Waterloo region live sustainably for 20 years. We have programs on home energy efficiency, water conservation, health yards, and waste reduction. And these programs empower participants to take climate action. And so today I'm gonna to talk about um, property owner actions that can be taken in the landscape that will help protect water quality and reduce community flood risk, both for the property owner and for downstream properties and neighboring properties. I'll first start with an overview of why this is important and what am I even talking about? So some context, and then I'll switch gears into when could you take some of these actions and how, when, where, and how, we'll say. So before I get started on some of the more specific things, um, it's important to have a good understanding of how a healthy watershed system works. Um, many, of this, many of you probably have seen something like this or know it very well, but here you see a typical watershed unit Rainwater falls on the land. Some of it's intercepted by trees and plants that are growing in the watershed. Some of it soaks into the soil on the ground. And once the ground is saturated, excess rain flows as runoff over land into streams and tributaries and ultimately rivers and lakes. Forests, soils, plants, and wetlands exist throughout this watershed to slow water down, soak it up, and filter it before it reaches our groundwater aquifers or rivers and lakes. So this is sort of a healthy functioning watershed unit um, that you would have expected to be prolific in Ontario and Canada um, prior to development. Now here you can see kind of an alternative version of a watershed, which is what most of us are more familiar with. Um, here you see conventional stormwater management systems, which involve stormwater catch basins and hard pipes that deliver runoff directly from individual properties or streets and into a pond and waterway. So you can see here rain falls on roofs and driveways and streets on the left, flows down the uh, curb into a stormwater catch basin, which you can see in the middle or along the curb of the neighborhood photo. And then pi a pipe system carries that water at high speed and often um, emits it right into a waterway, as you can see on the far right. Now this system is inelastic, it's impervious, and provides no way for runoff to slow down, soak into the ground, or be filtered. And all the benefits we saw on the last slide of forests and vegetation and soil providing water quality and flood control are virtually gone in this case. So in our area, um, we, and you probably already know this as well, um, we expect the effects of climate change to include an increase of annual precipitation and an increase in intensity of those rainfalls. So that system I showed before, which involves catch basins, hard pipes, and outlets into riverways, is going to be put to the test more so than ever now and into the future as we um, wrap our minds around the anticipated effects of climate change. And this increase in precipitation and intensity can cause increased river flooding as seen here, which is worsened because we've stripped away many of those important features of a healthy watershed. All of our runoff goes right into the waterways during the rain event because we've removed the natural plant communities and absorbent soils that would otherwise um, soak up some of that runoff. And so we see that here with fluvial flooding when a river overtakes its own banks due to a high volume of fast moving runoff entering it quickly during a rain event. And similarly, uh, we already see surface flooding increasing in our area and imagine many areas where you all are from. 
And we expect to see more of that, uh, primarily due to overwhelmed drainage systems and our propensity to pave over absorbent natural surfaces. So the stormwater management systems in many of our cities were sized decades ago when they were installed and the volume of water that they now need to service exceeds their capacity. So in many cases, uh, pipes are full and end up surcharging. So those catch basins I showed before, rather than taking in water are surcharging water and that causes flooding in basements and um, streets and things like that. So here's a picture of the Grand River watershed, which is the watershed that I live in in Kitchener. Um, you can see some of the main municipalities in here, Kitchener, Waterloo in the center, Guelph and Cambridge nearby and Brantford to the south. Um, and you can see the areas shaded in green are lands managed by the Grand River Conservation Authority. And what's significant about this image here is it kind of puts in perspective how much land in our watershed is under private property management. So individual property owners managing their land um, and managing the water that enters our Grand River watershed. When you're standing in a conservation area, it feels really big and wonderful. And that's, those are great features and wonderful places to be, but they are not very big when you look at the proportion of the watershed that's managed as a conservation area. So it really drives home the point that private property owners and managers have a big role in maintaining watershed health. So I've recently read a book called Nature's Best Hope by Douglas Tallamy. I highly recommend it. Um, and this book outlines why and how we need to rethink the role of our yards and private property in general as a major source of opportunity and hope in our efforts to combat and adapt to climate change. This book particularly is focused on combating the loss of biodiversity through private property decisions we make, the types of plants we put in our yards um, and the way we maintain our landscapes. But the principles definitely apply to water quality and flood control because all of these issues are linked to the need for contiguous healthy landscapes. So it's important that we steward our land properly and it's important that our neighbors steward their land properly and that will add up, aggregate to a large healthy functioning ecosystem that can return some of those features of the natural watershed unit I showed earlier. So by using soil, topography, and plants in strategic ways in our own landscapes, and I'll discuss how you can do that later on, we can reduce the amount of runoff that enters our local waterways. We can restore more of the natural flood regulation that a healthy watershed provides, and we can assist in the provision of clean water into our aquifers and rivers. And so the city of Kitchener certainly believes this message um, in showing that, that we are partnered with the city of Kitchener in a program called Rain Smart Neighborhoods. Um, through this program, we work with private property owners in targeted watersheds, sub watersheds throughout our area to help them understand why and how they can steward their land better uh, to create a more healthy watershed in our area. So for a little tiny bit more background on that program, um, a few years ago, the city of Kitchener developed an integrated stormwater master plan. And through that process, they identified 29 sub watersheds within the city of Kitchener. So a sub watershed is the land that drains into a tributary, which ultimately drains into the Grand River. So these are the little tributaries that build, build up the Grand River watershed. They graded each subwatershed um, against several criteria that included um, proportion of the subwatershed covered in forest, wetland, or riparian ecosystems, and how well connected those patches of habitat or ecosystems are. are. Uh, how much of each subwatershed's runoff is treated by some sort of uh, stormwater management feature, um, like an oil and grit separator or stormwater management pond. Um, the proportion of watershed covered in impervious surfaces, the proportion of stormwater pipes in each subwatershed that's currently at capacity or surcharging during uh, a design storm. And lastly, what proportion of property owners within each subwatershed uh, receive or take advantage of the city's stormwater credit program. So they assessed every subwatershed against those criteria and ranked the watersheds um, in order from priority one to priority four. 
And so now they have, um, they're focusing their municipal stormwater management works in the high priorities one and two subwatersheds. And as part of that effort, you can see here, um, they have uh, raised money from, or earned, received a grant, sorry, from uh, the Disaster Mitigation Adaptation Fund, which is a federal funding um, to target these priority one and two subwatersheds with enhanced stormwater management systems on municipal land. As part of that, they've partnered with us, Reap Green Solutions, to work with all the private property owners around those projects. So it's a really nice example of how public works can be uh, bolstered by private land management. And we're working together to try to um, increase the benefits of both of those actions to create a healthier watershed in these areas. So now I'll go into what we're doing with those private property owners, what types of work we're encouraging people to take and how to do that, when and how to do that. So in order to um, talk about various strategies and tools that you may consider for your private property, I'm going to start with a design property here, kind of like a generic property we can um, picture different projects on and understand their impact. So here you see an average moderate sized house with a driveway, a walkway, a back patio. This property is about 600 square meters. When a 28 millimeter rain event falls on this property, 5,516 liters of runoff exit the property because the majority of it is impervious hard surfaces or turf, which is relatively impervious. I've chosen a 28 millimeter storm for this because in our area, that is the 90th percentile storm, which means 90% of the rain events that occur in my area in one year are 28 millimeters or less. So that's a good benchmark when you're trying to design um, stormwater interventions. If we can capture 90% of the rain events on our own properties using rain gardens, rain barrels, and things like that, um, then we're, uh, achieving a significant impact on the amount of runoff that's entering the Grand River. So I'm going to go through several example projects and types of things you could consider on your own private property that show achievable residential scale ways we can build back a more functional watershed in our own yards. The first tool I'll talk about tonight is naturalization. So this is simply the replacement of low biodiversity, barren, resource intensive landscapes with a more diverse and absorbent set of plants. So basically to transform our idea of a yard from this to something like this. So clearly there are biodiversity and habitat benefits to this version of the yard, but there are also huge stormwater management benefits too. Obviously this yard has a lot more plant material and biomass above ground compared to the last one there. And that has huge interception benefits. So a, a predominant amount, a large amount of rain falling on this property doesn't even reach the soil because so much of it is intercepted by the plant mass above ground. So that's a big benefit right there. Once the um, water does flow through the biomass above ground, it hits the soil. Um, which is then the water filters through the soil into the root system. And the root system on these plants are much more uh, complex, deep and elaborate. And so more filtration happens and the water soaks in um, more efficiently. And then as well, any runoff that's generated from this property is moving a lot slower because it's flowing through so much plant material relative to a lawn. So to further illustrate that point, you can see here a variety of native plants that, that could be found in our area here in Ontario. Um, you can see a lot of biomass above ground and then a ton of biomass below ground in these complex and deep root systems. On the far uh, left, you can see a tiny green squiggle and a tiny black squiggle under it, and that's turf grass. So that gives you a little basis of comparison. Even this plant on the far right that's not very tall over on the right um, looks kind of similar to the turf grass above ground. Look at the root system below. So these kind of plants have huge benefits for ha uh, habitat for wildlife and pollinators, but as well major benefits for stormwater management. And so anytime you can decommission some lawn and turn it into a landscaping with these types of plants, you're going to be reducing the runoff that exits your property. 
Now, some people find that overwhelming lawns are nice and tidy and we have a cultural um, preference often for lawns and traditional landscapes. So I always like to show this picture here, um, which is a project I worked at, worked on for a homeowner who liked the idea of native plants, wanted to do the environmentally conscious thing, but had kind of old, old school notions of what belongs in a yard. Um, this person's really into daylilies um, and some non-native traditional landscaping plants. And we created this beautiful hedge row here where we've integrated little blue stem and butterfly weed, um, lupin and cardinal flower in with some more traditional landscape plants. And I just like to show this to remind people that you can still achieve really neat orderly landscapes using native plants. It's all about how you arrange them. And so if we replace this lawn uh, with naturalized landscaping, we could divert about 20% of the runoff coming up from the property. So we haven't been able to address much of the runoff generated from the roof and driveway and things like that yet, but we're reducing the runoff that's being generated from the turf grass. And that's a pretty significant uh, impact. So rainwater harvesting is the next tool I'll talk about. Everybody knows what rainwater harvesting is. I'm sure you either own or see rain barrels all the time, um, but there's lots of neat things to consider with rain barrels um, so that you can really maximize the benefits of rainwater harvesting. So rainwater is much better for plants, for starters, than uh, tap water that you get out of your hose um, and as well, it's free. So if you're into gardening, this is a really good uh, tool to put in your tool belt. And there's lots of things to consider to integrate rain barrels with hardscaping so that you're not, so the rain barrel is not a hassle. There's, it's not uh, blocking where you want to walk or there's not hoses laying around. So you can see this homeowner here we worked with to lay out their pathway um, around from the driveway over to the front porch in a way that also allowed rain barrels to be used up against the downspout and then any overflow from the rain barrels was channeled into a pipe. You can see on the right corner where the downspout's going directly down. That's sending what runoff in the winter months when the rain barrels aren't in use uh, into an underground pipe system that goes underneath the walkway and is outletted into a naturalized landscape on the left. So in the winter, it just stays in the downspout. In the warmer months, it's diverted into the rain barrels and then any overflow goes down into that same pipe. So while rain barrels can be the cheapest, easiest thing to do, it's important to think about where you're going to put them and how you're going to use them before you do any larger scale projects, like construct a, a path or something, because once the path is in, it's more difficult to uh, do this kind of underground configuration. And so some people don't really anticipate wanting to use water from a rain barrel, and that's understandable, but they're still really valuable. So in order to make a rain barrel very valuable though, it needs to be empty. Otherwise it's full and so water is bypassing it and going out the overflow and you're not really a, a providing a benefit to the watershed. If the rain barrel is empty, you're capturing that water, 220 liters is how big like a standard rain barrel is usually. You're keeping that in your property in the rain barrel during a heavy rain event. And that's pre preventing that 220 liters from rushing into the stormwater system when it's at peak demand during a rain event. So even if you're releasing it immediately after a rain event or the day after through a soaker hose, like you see on the right, you're still providing a really great benefit to the watershed. So some people don't care too much about watering. So the soaker hose option on the right is a really good way to provide benefits to the watershed without the hassle of having to empty your rain barrel with a watering can or something. Um, for me, I I'll hoard my water because I like gardening a lot and I want to have it when I need it. So I really hate emptying my rain barrel unless I'm really sure um, that it's going to rain. Um, so I, I have a couple of rain barrels connected in a row and that way I can definitely keep one full while, and have one kind of emptied out before I anticipate a rain event. So rain barrels are relatively low impact in terms of reducing the runoff from this property. Um, if I put two on this house, so maybe on two corners where there's downspouts, I can divert about 7% of that design storm I shared earlier. And like I said, that only you can only achieve that if your rain barrel is empty when it rains. If it's full, you're diverting 0% of the rain event. 
All right, the next uh, tool I will talk about is rain gardens. These are, these are my favorite uh, things to work on. I have a lot of examples, so I'll try to give you a good overview, but also give you some visual eye candy to get inspired. This is a rain garden we worked on at a church that wanted to reduce its environmental impact as that was an important sort of mission for the church community, but also we wanted to use that as an opportunity to beautify the entryway into the church, which you can see in the background. So this downspout, the big white leader coming down the building now empties into a rain garden. You can see, you can't really see too much in there right now um, in terms of where the water goes, but there's a basin in there and all the, a lot of the water is absorbed into that before it runs out onto the parking lot. So here's a better view of what a rain garden looks like uh, from inside. So a rain garden is a shallow sunken garden depression in the ground that's strategically located downhill from a point source of water, like a downspout. So water flows out of this downspout through a rocky inlet, the rocks help catch any chunky debris like leaves or shingle soot that might be coming out and slows the water down quite a bit before it flows into this basin. The basin here has been amended with a thick layer, sometimes up to 60 centimeters of sandy compost soil. And that promotes really great drainage in this area. Um, rain gardens are sized according to the area that's draining to them so that that 90% or 90 percentile storm would be captured in this, but we always want to be prepared for a situation where that storm is in that last 10% or occasional these huge storms we get that are unusual. And so in that case, when the rain garden is saturated and the top area is full, then water can flow out of the outlet towards the storm drain as it normally would. So we always want to create a clear path from the downspout to a storm drain so that we're prepared for a really big rain event. Uh, we never want to make our own homes more vulnerable to flooding. But if we strategically locate a rain garden like this here, we will capture about 1,500 liters of water before it would go to the storm drain. So a really big impact. So I'll show a few examples now. Here's a home in downtown Kitchener that um, lost a tree on the right. It was dead and the city was going or came to cut it down and tear out the stump. And so the homeowners wanted to take advantage of that uh, now bowl-shaped hole in their front yard and get rid of their grass. So they had something else, uh, a more beautiful landscape alternative and less mowing maintenance. And so we turned their front yard into a naturalized landscape with a rain garden. You can now see rain flows out of the downspout through the rocky inlet into a basin bowl-shaped garden, and then any excess flows out of the rocks here in the foreground. So critical to a rain garden functioning is that sandy compost mix I described earlier. So here you can see us working with volunteers to sculpt the bowl shape that we sized according to the drainage area that's going into it. So we made sure that this um, basin would hold the majority of our rain event, that 90% target. Then we fill, backfilled the basin with a 60% sand, 40% compost mix. And again, obviously the sand helps that soil just soak up water really quickly. And then the compost helps provide the nutrients required for the plants to thrive. And the plants in a rain garden aren't 100% necessary if you have well-draining soil and the topography right, but the plants add a ton of value in terms of that biomass above and below ground um, to help transpire water back into the atmosphere and soak it into the ground with its root systems and filter it along the way. So again, here's a rain garden like the day we built it. Um, and this is just a kind of reminder to say when you're planting with native plants, it's really important to remember the mature size. They're often, when you buy them, they're often little tiny baby plants. And then this is just a few months later, they're already multiple times bigger. Um, and so now that, that was a couple of years ago, so the plants are even bigger uh, now. So that's a little disclaimer to plan out gardens with the mature plant size in mind. Here's another example um, of a before at the top. So this homeowner had a very traditional landscape and her landscape beds were all raised, kind of shallow berm type of features. And that's a really common thing to do in your yard. You have your grass and you build up a bit, a bit for the landscape bed and plant it and wood chip it. 
But if we could just flip that idea and, and recess our landscape beds, then they can become rain gardens and absorb runoff. So this homeowner was fighting a fight constantly trying to get that runoff from her downspout around her landscaped peninsula there um, and try, trying to prevent washout because the water is rushing out of her downspout and washing away the wood chips um, and causing puddling in the lawn. And so in this case, we just need to flip her ideas of what shape a landscape bed is. Um, and we created a concave one um, in the front area where you can see the um, spray paint. So now the water comes out of her downspout and actually flows into the direction we want because we created the con concave um, swale, little channel that leads the water into the basin in the front, which is filled with rain garden plants. Another example of a homeowner who had a kind of small patch of lawn, uh, I guess wasn't enjoying it as much as they were hoping to, and had a lot of runoff coming down two different downspouts there from neighboring properties and their own property, um, and wanted to transform their landscape into something more beautiful, more functional for their child, and uh, to reduce runoff coming off the property. So they installed a rain barrel, um, and the overflow from the rain barrel flows into uh, this rain garden here, you can see. And an additional homeowner from Guelph that we worked with through a rain garden program we do with the city of Guelph. I don't have the before picture, sadly, but picture this with just lawn. <laughs> that was the before. So this homeowner, cre homeowner created a beautiful rain garden on the right, used some of similar plants, on the left to, um, to go underneath a tree planting. So it has kind of combined natural landscaping on the left with a rain garden on the right to create a beautiful mature garden. I think this is one of my last examples here. So here's a before of a downspout, clearly not doing anyone any favors. Um, running into the neighbor's yard, which is an ideal and washing out the plants the turf at the base of it. So generally just some compacted, unhealthy turf area here. So really we're, this property is not taking advantage of the landscape to help reduce runoff. So this homeowner's installed a rain barrel and then the overflow of the rain barrel is then channeled through an existing U hedge here and into a rain garden. So again, that runoff coming out of the pipe there is slowed down quite a bit in, by the rocks before it enters the rain garden and further into the yard. Oops. And so there's a still image of what that rain garden looks like, freshly planted. So again, those plants will be a lot more mature uh, this year. And another view of it to say, or just to remind you that rain gardens don't have to be big um, pond looking features in your front yard. They can be integrated into a larger landscape plan um, as seen here. So similar plants were used in other areas of the landscape or coordinating plants, I'd say, to create sort of a cohesive landscape in the front yard, reduce the turf and incorporate rain garden soils and part of it to help absorb that runoff. And so imperative to a functioning rain garden, as I said, was the soil mix, the sand and compost mix, but also plant uh, selection is critically important. So we've created a rain garden plant list that's on the resource sheet that Monica um, showed earlier and we'll send out later and on our reapgreen.ca website. But rain garden plants are unique. Generally, they're native uh, almost always, and they are uh, adapted to tolerate complete inundation during a rain event and then extreme drought in between rain events because that sandy soil is going to drain so quickly, it's going to be a pretty harsh environment between rain events. But because you're channeling roof water to the basin, it'll be in standing water for a few hours during a rain event. So a unique set of plants, it's important you get the right plants or you may be disappointed in the outcome of your project. Um, and there's a lot of beautiful flowering perennials um, of various sizes that you can use. And there are also a variety of shrubs that also have other benefits to um, create winter interest during the garden or provide habitat to larger animals as well as pollinators. Uh, one caveat I'll add is native shrubs can get really big. So like a nanny berry is a beautiful uh, flowering viburnum that can be 16 feet tall. So that belongs in the forest often. Um, 
so if you're planning something like this for a smaller property, or let's say a residential urban yard, um, consider looking at a native R, which is something you can get at a retail garden center. Um, that's like a smaller cultivar version of a native plant. And they have many of the same benefits as native plants, but fit better in smaller properties. So if you're looking at this plant list and see these really huge sizes, don't be dismayed. Um, Red is your dogwood is a good example. So that gets to be, could be a, like 10 by 10 feet. So that's huge. But this garden here, I've, I've used red, uh, dwarf red twig dogwoods in the background and they're quite a bit smaller. I think they get four by four at maturity. And here's the church garden again, I showed at the beginning. And the picture on the right is, I think, late spring, early summer, where there's uh, spiderwort, blue flag iris, heuchera blooming. And on the left is late summer, where there's echinacea, um, black eyed Susan, and some feather reed grass, uh, yeah, blooming, and fox sedge in the center. So to say, you can create a lot of different aesthetics if you pay attention to what plants you're planting and when they bloom. So I like to remind everyone to make a little chart of the plants you're thinking about planting and jot down what, when they bloom so that you're sure there's something interesting going on in your garden, spring, summer, late summer, fall. Um, and there's some uh, value to pollinators throughout the all, all years long as well. And so for those of you who are not too into plants um, or don't have the space or maintenance regime that where you can incorporate a rain garden. This is a project that's similar to a rain garden, but I would call this an infiltration gallery um, or a dry creek bed. It uses a lot of the same principles, but is a rock feature basically instead of um, using plants. And so this summer had an existing landscape in the upland areas using just whatever, any old plant that you could use normally. Um, they're not in, in standing water like in a rain garden. And then you can see these downspout connectors up against the house and they channel water underground. And you can see the ends of the pipes here or then rainwater can flow through this rocky feature. It still contains deep, sandy, rocky soil. So the, the water does soak into the ground, but it has a very different aesthetic. And there's just a little zoom in of what that looks like where the water's coming out into uh, this rock feature. So rain gardens and infiltration galleries have a big impact. They can divert about 30% of the runoff from this property. And that is assuming that we're diverting downspouts on this home into one rain garden that's about the average size for residential property, which can hold about 1500 liters. That's typical from my experience. So trees is our next uh, tool we can use. And everyone's very familiar, I'm sure, with the myriad benefits of trees, um, in addition to their beauty, their mental health benefits, uh, air quality benefits. They provide huge stormwater benefits. So here you can see the role of trees with respect to stormwater management. Interception is huge. It's one of the first benefits they provide. And you can relate to that probably by picturing like where you'd want to be during a rain. If you run under a tree, you're significantly drier than if you didn't. So up to 40% of a rain event can just be trapped in the leaves of a tree and never even reach the ground. So that's a huge service right there. A lot of the rain is captured above ground and never has to be managed in our conventional stormwater management systems. Water that does make it through the canopy um, hits the ground and is infiltrated by the root system and filtered. The roots also provide soil stabilization. So as the soil becomes saturated and runoff water, rainwater becomes runoff, the um, roots work to stabilize the soil as, as it's flowing over land towards our creeks and rivers. And then the canopy trunk and roots also work to um, aid in evapotranspiration, which is returning a lot of that precipitation back into the atmosphere. So if we trans transferred a lot of this lawn space into not necessarily forest, but we planted trees so the canopy covered the majority of this lawn space, we could divert about 20% of the runoff from this property. If we reor reoriented the downspouts of the house, they're flowing into forested areas as well, then we can start to look at bigger numbers where we could um, divert about 45% of this the runoff on this property. 
So partly it's about changing the land cover in the yard, but the second part is about diverting the hard surfaces like your roof, diverting that those downspouts into some of those areas strategically. Permeable paving, I believe is my last tool I'll be talking about today. Um, you're probably familiar with this largely. So there's lots of different types of permeable paving. What you can see here is a unit paver. And it looks fairly similar to any old unit paver, sidewalk, patio, or driveway that you may have already or have seen before, though there are a few critical differences. Um, you can see in the joints of this, the, the bricks here, the unit pavers have little notches around them, on them, and that prevents the joints from butting together over time. So when we have pavers in our driveways and their uh, cars are sitting on them or driving over them, winter, snow um, sits on them and the ground kind of heaves. Those bricks can move and, and butt together and the joints kind of seal off. And similarly, uh, the polymeric sand we put in those joints for traditional paving gets wet and binds together to become a solid basically. So here you see these notches prevent the bricks from butting together. So it maintains a thick joint. And then we're putting coarse sand in those joints, which helps um, water flow through the joints into a gravel reservoir below. So while the top layer, the concrete pavers is like the fun aesthetic decision to make when you're doing a landscape project, um, it's what's underneath that that's really important. So the top layer is just to get water to flow through it. So we're really thinking about what kind of joints we um, have to get water to flow through that layer of paving. Underneath it is a much larger bed of uh, gravel uh, or reservoir area for the water that does flow through the joints to sit and be stored temporarily until it can soak into the soil below. And so this is the part that kind of makes permeable paving it cost a bit more than traditional paving. You're excavating deeper, removing more um, soil than you would for a traditional driveway and then importing more gravel than you would. But we've worked with a few homeowners who had pretty tough situations in their property and it was worth the added expense to switch to permeable paving and improve the runoff situation. This homeowner, you can see they had a um, bad driveway. It was degraded over time. You can kind of tell by the type of damage on the driveway that there was a lot of washout happening, a lot of water flowing over it. And you can see why, because there's a downspout on the corner of their driveway <clears throat> or on the garage rather, but there's also a downspout on the neighbor's yard next door. So there's a lot of water flowing over this driveway from the various properties around it. And that homeowner <clears throat> replaced their driveway with permeable unit pavers, as you can see here, and constructed a, a rain garden uh, just kind of slightly uphill from the driveway to help absorb water coming from the neighbor's property before it would flow towards the driveway. So a huge improvement aesthetically and functionally for this homeowner. Uh, this homeowner, uh, this is a rental and the homeowner wanted to just improve the environmental footprint of the property as well, while maintaining some critical parking for tenants. So it went from this to this, which is much more attractive, I would say. And they combined permeable paving for that parking area and walkway, but then added trees and naturalized landscaping um, on the left side. And then you can see kind of a pea gravel footpath, which is a great way to create a permeable walkway without the expense of the unit pavers, but not suitable for cars. So it's kind of using different strategies depending on the level of foot traffic and weight that each one would receive. Permeable driveways and paving have a pretty big impact, which is good because they're more expensive, probably the most expensive project I've talked about today. Um, if we transferred this, pro this property, our test properties, hard surfaces, the driveway and walkway and patio to permeable paving, we could divert 30% of the home, of the property's runoff and return it to the soil rather than have it run off. And so we've talked about a bunch of different strategies and I've talked about the impact. I think one of the highest impacts was like maybe 30% of the, dri the permeable dri uh, driveways I just talked about, the trees, I think we got to like 20%. And so it's combining these things where we can really see a big impact. So that test property, if we combine rain barrels overflowing into rain gardens, we transition some of the hard surfaces into permeable paving 
and naturalize some of the remaining landscape where a rain garden doesn't make sense, but we don't want to have the turf. We could divert 80% of that, that 28 millimeter storm, which is a big rain event. So imagine all the other smaller rain events that would be hundred percent diverted. So it's this treatment train where we combine different strategies together, where we can really reduce the runoff uh, from an individual property. And if we start implementing those kind of changes across many properties aggregated together, we can actually achieve big improvements for our watersheds, water quality and habitat in our local waterways. And so with that, I will see if there's any questions. Uh, thank you so much, Becca. I'll get you to keep up your PowerPoint because there were some specific questions submitted okay. for certain slides, but thank you so much for that yeah. wonderful presentation. Um, I know I was getting really happy just looking at all of the beautiful <laughs> plants and thinking about spring and summer and all these actions we're going to be able to implement very soon. So yeah, good. thank you so much for that. And um, we do yeah. have a couple questions. Some people have asked about specific slides and whether we'll be able to share the photos. So I'll talk with you about that and we will be yeah. sharing those in that email that goes out to people next week and making sure people have links out to all of the great resources and diagrams you shared in your presentation. Someone was asking how you were getting the percentages. So in those raindrops, you're talking about the different mm -hmm. percentages, each project, um, the benefit of it. How are you finding those percentages? That's a great question. It's kind of complicated <coughs> for in terms of answering like on Zoom here, but uh, there's, I calculated the, volume of water that would hit that property based on its area, basically. And I calculated the area of each land cover. So roof, driveway, lawn, and each of those surfaces has a runoff coefficient associated with it. That's kind of standard practice. So we, um, I don't have them on the top of my head, but like an asphalt roof generates like 0.9 is the, the runoff coefficient, meaning like some of it stays on the roof, but the majority of it runs off. So the lower the coefficient, the more the surface absorbs. So I used some math, light math, to uh, divide the volume of water that would be on that surface, or I multiplied it with the coefficient, runoff coefficient, to figure out how much runoff would be generated from each of those surfaces. And then I, that, so that's like the how I started with the full the 5,000 liter number. And then uh, I just subtracted out for each tool, like how much would that one rain garden absorb? Well, 1,500 liters. So kind of subtracted it from there. There's some additional math to figure out how much water like a rain garden would hold. And that's to do with, um, again, some standard math assumptions about the pore space and sand, how much water can be held in a sandy uh, volume uh, and things like that. There's a cool tool for anyone interested in trees. Um, iTree is a calculator. I think it's through the U.S. Forest Department or Forest Service. But you can type in and map um, specific age and species of trees, um, and it will help you calculate the benefits like each year or aggregated over its lifetime to understand uh, the volume of water that's absorbed by certain trees or intercepted. And so that's where I got those numbers, but that's really cool to practice. It's really easy to use. Um, so I encourage anyone who's interested in that to play around with iTree and um, get a better understanding of like maybe trees in your property or trees you're thinking about planting and you can calculate really specifically the stormwater impact that the, they will have over time. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. The next question is about pavers that are permeable. So someone was saying that they've heard of pavers that are permeable and not counting the permeability of the areas between the pavers and under the pavers. They're just asking you to comment on that. Um, I'm, um, I guess I don't fully understand the question of pavers that, so the ones I showed were all unit pavers, meaning the joints are important for the passageway for the water to go through. Um, and then the reservoir underneath is where you store it all. So that's like the important calculation where you're making sure that's big enough to hold the water that's falling on the driveway. There are other types of permeable pavers I didn't show because I don't have any personal project experience with those, but you, I've seen them around town or you can research them, which could be like gravel pave or 
there's various like plastic grid products that you can tack together and that's creating like a infrastructure for your driveway that can uh, tolerate the weight of the vehicle. You can backfill those plastic grids with soil and plant plants or uh, sedums and things like that, or you could backfill it with decorative gravel. So it looks like a pea gravel path, like I showed before, but it has the infrastructure underneath to be able to hold the weight of a car. Um, so, and there's permeable asphalt and other types of like kind of single pour products that just let water through as well. That would be different from the ones I've showed. I don't necessarily know if I answered the question exactly. <laughs> there was a clarification saying that the pavers themselves are permeable. Oh, like they soak up water, like little sponges or something. I don't know. I mean, a certain amount of water is held in the paver. I don't know about that product in particular, if it's one that absorbs water itself rather than just lets it through. Um, I'm sure there's something like that, whether it absorbs water fast enough during a rain event, I guess I would wonder, I would want to learn more about that. So I think what I'm talking about with the joints and the gravel underneath would be most effective during a heavy rain when the material can't absorb it. So that gravel reservoir is critical for heavy rain events because the soil or permeable paper, whatever, doesn't have time to absorb the water at the same rate that it's falling. So that's when I'm talking about these reservoir systems, it's kind of like a time sensitive thing. It's holding it just long enough until whatever material around it can soak it up. Okay. And people are wondering if there are contacts or resources for getting help in other places besides uh, the Waterloo Gulf region. Um, check out Green Communities Canada possibly to find out what so sort of similar um, agencies or organizations are working in your community. We try to make our resources available to anyone. Um, so you can always check our website for stuff to learn for yourself. Like obviously our on-site services are just available in certain municipalities. But the other thing I'd recommend is advocating for your municipality with your town uh, council members or other local government representatives, because um, this is a public issue. Uh, flood risk is a public issue. And these are real strategies that help reduce community flood risk. And so the partnership we have with the city of Kitchener really acknowledges that. And um, so the municipality is providing funding for us to support property owners. And I think that's really critical to achieve changes uh, and enough changes to make an impact. Um, so that would be what I would encourage everyone to do if you are thinking something like this would be uh, helpful in your municipality. And Great, you can and I share can... our stuff as an example. Yeah, and uh, our website is much the same. A lot of free resources and evaluation tools for people on their own properties. And then, if you specifically have a shoreline property, and shoreline can be along a lake, river, tributary, creek, like any type of water, um, you can always look at our Natural Edge program, which is focused on using native plants to help restore that native buffer which was one of the strategies that Becca outlined and information about the natural edge will also go out in that email to everyone next week. Um, someone is wondering if like how you would implement a rain garden on a property that has a steep slope. That's a great question. So steep slope can um, often be a deal breaker for a rain garden. So kind of some tips of locating a rain garden. It does need to be on a relatively flat area. Um, so I'd be looking obviously above or below that steep slope to see if that would make sense to do it above the slope or below, depending on where your point source of water is. So often a downspout. Um, another kind of good general rule is rain garden is usually not best suited for the problem area. So let's say you, this picture actually I have up was a property that had a drainage area down, a problem down by the shed that you can see in the background. So it was like pooling water kind of between the picnic table and the shed. So that's not the location where you should put a rain garden because that's too late. The problem's already happened. So we looked uphill from the problem, but downhill from the source of the problem, which was the downspout and put a rain garden there in the middle. So we captured all the water from the problem, the source, 
in the rain garden and prevented any of the addition, any additional water from come, going down to the problem area, if that makes sense. So if you have a wet spot or drainage issue um, out in your yard, you want to be looking uphill from it, you know, very slightly uphill um, to implement a solution like this. And then similarly downhill from the downspout or driveway or wherever the water is coming from that you're trying to capture. We have some videos on our website that are quick, easy ways to show you how to size a rain garden based on the, the area of um, surface that's draining to it and things like that. So you get pretty far, hopefully with the resources that we um, have provided. The steep slope, I would consider looking at um, other types of plant material you could put on that slope that might uh, slow down any runoff or washout that's happening on that hill, as opposed to digging down and amending the soil, because that would destabilize the slope likely. So like, uh, like on the riparian edges of a waterway, like Monica was referring to, naturalizing the edge would be better than um, trying to create a rain garden because you're destabilizing the bank, for example. We have a few more questions, but just before we hit 11 o'clock, I want to let everyone know that there is an anonymous feedback survey link in the chat. So if you could just let us know how today went, it's very short survey and like I said, anonymous, but it would be very beneficial for Becca and I just to know how today went and if there are other questions or other topics that you are interested in seeing featured in this webinar series, that is the place to tell us. And so we'll get to the last two questions, I think that'll get us to 11 o'clock. So are rain gardens suitable for areas with heavier clay soils? Good question. So another fundamental step in constructing a wetland is to, or I keep saying wetland, a rain garden, we're not constructing wetlands here, um, is to understand the type of soil you have and how well it drains. Again, there, I've made a little video last year of how to do an infiltration test, which will tell you the answer to those two questions. Um, you can build a rain garden in clay soils, but you have to export most of the native soil, the clay, and replace it with sand and compost. So you're going to be generating fill to get rid of and put somewhere else on your property. Often rain gardens have kind of low berms around them because it's an easy place to put the soil you're digging out of the basin somewhere artfully. Um, so many of the examples I showed, there's kind of like a rim around the rain garden that's built up and planted. It's not like super obvious after you're done, but that's because you're shoveling out the basin and just turning over the soil nearby and then kind of raking it out to look semi-natural. So yeah, it's about removing the clay and replacing with the sand and compost. So those of you who are lucky enough to live on a sandier soil, rain garden is going to be cheaper and easier to install because you don't have to remove so much of the native soil. You're really just sculpting the earth to have that basin shape. Um, and then the soil is already pretty well draining. So for my property here, it's very sandy. So I sculpted the earth to make it a rain garden function. I didn't need to amend a ton of the soil. I removed some to create the basin. And then I amended my sandy soil with compost. So you can do it in any soil type. You just need to know what your soil type is so you can plan for your amendments accordingly. Okay, and our last question is of just someone asking about tips for implementing a rain garden or permeable driveway where they have utilities or gas lines in their front yard. Good question. So I also did a webinar earlier this spring called how to design your rain garden or something along those lines with extremely many more details about exactly how to do all this with lots of examples of each critical step. And I think that's available. It is available on our website. So if you're interested in this, I highly recommend watching that um because it will go through all the steps one of which is to contact uh ontario one call in our case if you live in other areas in canada you have something similar i'm sure you call that number register your project um for us you like kind of circle an area on your yard where you're thinking of digging and then they'll come and spray the location of your utilities that are below ground or email you a map and tell you the depth of them and then you know where you can dig where you need to hand dig as opposed to use an excavator so that you don't tear out a utility um, or where you need to maybe make it a little bit shallower so you're not impacting the pipes. So very few times are the utilities a deal breaker, but you do need to know where they are and how deep they are so you can plan accordingly. 
Awesome. And I will track down that link for that webinar and we can include that in the yeah. email that goes out to everyone too. Okay. Well, we're right at 11. So thank you so much again, Becca, for a wonderful presentation. Lots of people in the comments saying that it was very helpful and that they learned mm -hmm. a lot. So I think this is a great message for us this spring and especially on Earth Day, just that there are lots of actions we can take individually on our property, no matter the size, as you showed, and there are ways that we can help benefit our freshwater health and also provide valuable habitat for wildlife. So thank you so much, Becca. Thanks for having me.